Hello and welcome to another episode of Latitude. There is increasing concern in the United States and in Western countries about the aggressive activities and the wide-ranging impact of China's efforts to conduct cyber theft and telecom thefts. And the most prominent examples of that in recent days has been the hacking of more than 500 million users of the Marriott hotel chain database. At the same time, the arrest of a very high-profile Chinese CFO of the Huawei a company which has a massive turnover and has the blessings of the Chinese government has created uh, very clearly the lines that are now being drawn between the West and China in terms of cyber, cyber security and the theft of technology. Back home in India, also, the government has issued notices to about 60 Chinese who are working in certain companies in the western region of India. And though they are here on tourist visas, they have been seen to be working quite closely in terms of technology and cyber technology efforts of the company to make products. To what extent this is part of a bigger Chinese design and to what extent India could become also a victim of China's agenda to have complete control over the cyber elements of our society. This discussion will show us. We have two experts with us. We have Mr. Jitin Jain, the CEO of Indian InfoSec Consortium, I believe a consortium of hundreds of experts who look at cyber threat. And uh, they are obviously very well informed on a variety of cyber issues. And we look to have your views. And we have once again my friend, uh, Professor Hashpant, of King's College London, professor of war studies, and here currently in India with the ORF as a distinguished fellow. So, uh, Jiten, I want to ask you that in China, uh, what choices do companies have when they indulge in acts which the West clearly sees as theft, espionage, or whatever, when Chinese legislation make it mandatory under the national intelligence law for Chinese companies to have involvement with the state's agenda and do as they are told, obviously, otherwise they go out of business. Well, I mean, it's not only uh, uh, there in China, it's there in the West also. So if you take the example of America, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, or, you know, visa court orders, or if you talk about Chinese, I mean, if you talk about Huawei itself, the example you cited in the opening remarks, I mean, it's very well written in their agreement that, you know, uh, the data of the users uh, will be transferred to a jurisdiction mm. outside where the services or equipment of Huawei is being provided. Mm. Uh, and the laws of the jurisdiction may be different or laws or data protection law may not even exist. Mm. What this essentially means is that no matter where you are in the world, if you're using a Huawei product, any sort of data passing through those Huawei products or stored in those Huawei products can be any time accessed or transferred back to China. And that makes Indian companies and that is because, also vulnerable. That is because of the compliance with the Chinese you know, uh, uh, laws. Now, that makes everyone vulnerable, not only Indian companies, but American companies, Western countries, you know, everyone. So, and, and we are living in an era where in the last 10 years, there is a remarkable success of Huawei uh, by selling affordable consumer gadgetry. They've, they've gone on to become in last, you know, last year the second largest mobile manufacturer in the world. Mm. I mean, if you look at you know, the, the network of 70 countries in the world, the primary equipment of the core networks is you know, running on Huawei or you know, other Chinese companies' equipments. I mean, these are challenging times. Okay, I'll come back to you about how the West is now perceiving that. But yes, clearly Huawei has now last year posted a revenue profit of $93 billion Thanks. or more. Uh, Hush, uh, there is obviously concern in the U.S. now. But do you think the U.S. has woken up too late? Because this has been an ongoing intrusion into the U.S. mind, intellectual, artificial intelligence space and cyberspace for quite some time. And to now say that China is eating into U.S. data for Chinese purposes, has it come because there are certain actions of the Chinese that have begun to hurt the U.S. industry? For instance, the taking away of the designs of one of America's fifth-generation fighter aircrafts. 
Uh, absolutely, and I think now they have read that there is a recognition in, in Washington that, look, what has happened over the last decade or even, or, or even longer is that China systematically eroding at the power base of the U.S., and US, uh, the ability of the U.S. to be the global superpower in large part relies on its ability to be at the cutting edge of high-end technology. Mm. So when you're talking of quantum computing, when you're talking of 5G coming into the, into the mix, when you're talking of AI, you are basically looking at a country that has led in these, in, in, led from the front. Mm. And now as you have the Chinese coming into, uh, into, the, into the landscape, eroding at some of these fundamental strengths, mm. and they're, they're, they're waking up. And I think partly the waking up has to do with this, with this consensus in the American intellectual establishment that, look, uh, if only China were to integrate into the global international order, it, it would become like us. Mm. The recognition is now that it is not becoming like, like yes. us. It is challenging virtually every single norm. Mm. No, you know, whether you're looking at maritime, uh, whether you're looking at basic how, uh, human rights norms, whether you're looking at how the countries operate uh, their cyber spaces. Right. So I think now that question is out in the open and, and uh, the West is, has recognized the challenge. And the question that you had asked earlier about India, perhaps, that perhaps we are not yet, there yet in terms of recognizing the challenge that the the West is now uh, too late. To or we are just too lazy to innovate and quite happy for the Chinese to do our work. <laughs> yes, I think, uh, uh, well, I don't think we are lazy. I think partly we need to uh, wake up from the slumber because we are always uh, behind the curve, mm. if you will, mm. in terms of the strategic thinking that involves it. How do you, how do you prepare yourself for the fourth industrial revolution? Are yeah. we preparing ourselves or are we putting ourselves into these blinkers which will allow some other country to take the opportunities away from us? And I think okay, that's a question. Jitain, you know, it's opinions. exactly the point I was coming to that Harsh has made. That you see the fear in the American, uh, American establishment is that they've been in the forefront for a long time. But for 10 critical technologically laid out areas that the Chinese have now spelt out for Made in China 2025, a lot of those aims can be achieved only by what an American expert, John Demers, has called by simply robbing, replicating, or replacing. Yeah. And a classic example of that is that the Chinese have, from nowhere, gone to create the DRAM technology, which is really the kind of technology that the Americans felt that the Chinese and the companies that have been co-opted didn't have, but within a year, suddenly, these technologies appeared on the surface of these companies, which showed the highest end of capability a new company couldn't possibly acquire so quickly. Well, I mean, it's been happening over the you know, last couple of decades. As Professor you know, Pand rightly pointed out, uh, you know, they never wanted to integrate into the world order. They just wanted to get inside and create their own ruckus. I mean, you take the example of Lockheed Martin or you know, uh, stealing the plans of fifth generation fighter you know, jets. Or you take the example of uh, you know, China recently launched the, uh, a satellite for providing interpret communications for military domain with quantum cryptography. Mm -hmm. And if you read the, read the WikiLeaks cable you know, released five years back, mm -hmm. they clearly stated out that US has written that China has stolen our, our entire technology, you know, which was further developed in the Shanghai University, uh, you know, for and China has made much more advancements than US itself mm. by stealing their own technology. Mm. So this affordable gadgetry selling across the world, there is a, now a you know worldwide conclusion that this is a part of larger nefarious Chinese design of a you know state-sponsored hacking machinery. I think somewhere down the line, our governments have failed to realize that cyber security is now becoming an essential part of national security strategy, and we have to ensure sure that the f next war will be fought on the frontiers of technology, not on the conventional battlefields. Exactly. That's the point we wish to make after break, to look at how cybersecurity could clearly impact on national security, both at the military level, at the planning level, and at the level of our businesses. But that, after break. <laughs> Welcome back. We are looking at the espionage and theft activities of Chinese companies and their ability to reach out right across the world in the developed world and in countries like India where they are wanting to carve out a space for themselves but also having access to some of our most sensitive thinking and our areas. Professor Hashpant, uh, I read some time ago a piece, a fairly well-researched piece in an international magazine uh, in which they talked about that future conflicts are not going to be about aircrafts and tanks rolling off uh, the runways and battlefields, but 
about how cyber weapon systems and cyber planning could really be the defining point in future conflicts. Two quick questions. One is, is that going to apply across the board? So are we looking at some kind of a impact on defense budgeting and cutting down on forces, but increasing cyber armies? And to what extent are we anywhere near the capabilities that you need to have to deal with the Chinese? Well, first question is, uh, if first, uh, the, the answer for the first question is, of course, I think we need some kind of a def defense restructuring at, at fundamental level. And I think that is, that is a sense you get when you hear uh, our uh, defense leadership talk about, you know, how do you cut the flab, how do you uh, allocate the defense budget in ways in which technology is reinforced. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the second point that you make is, is perhaps very valid in, in, in the sense that I don't think uh, there is yet a coherent idea as to what is it that we want to do with the cyber security threat that we have outlined. And do we, do we have a sense of what the threat is coming from? I think the earlier discussion that we were having was that the threat is not going to be very palpable. The threat is not going to be very, uh, you know, something that you you can hold on to threat is going to be somewhere hidden uh, amongst our you know day to day appliances and day to day uh, utilities mm. and that is a sense that i think we need we need to understand what is the debate in the west what it is about mm. you know this is the this is the liberal sphere mm. and when the liberal sphere is talking about removing china from their midst uh, in terms of uh, ability of china to uh, wheel access via its technology via its uh, uh, access to high end cutting edge technology i think what we need to learn is that why is it that we are not following in that direction mm. why is it that we are behind the curve and mm. why is it some of the questions that are being asked in the west are not still being asked in india when we are looking at cyber threat, that's the cyber threat we need to be talking about. Of course, it can be very sophisticated, but at the end of the day, but the first level of that threat is going to come from the kinds of discussions that we are having right now. Yeah, I mean, they, we've been notorious in, in, in our uh, military and government establishment for having a sense of abhorrence for intellectual pluralism. You know, the, the Sahab knows it all, and that's where it rests <laughs> in his files. But, Jiten, I want to ask you with reference to the uh, Marriott data threat. Now, two or three important points emerge from that. One is that initially when apparently, and now U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has gone on record to say that indications are very clear that the Chinese did the data theft. Why did they do it? 500 million people's data of all sorts were taken, which I'm told which ranges from passport details to travel details to check-in, check-out date, etc. And interestingly, also there was a hacking of another important department in the U.S. called the Office of Personal Management. Yeah. Initially, Last people year. thought that this is not an NSA hacking, so we can live with it. But some 22 million people whose data was taken out. And if you come down the percentage levels, and even if you come to 2 million people or whatever, and further filter down, what the Chinese are looking at are very important people whose personal data are available there, such as government personnel, scientists, industrialists, and defense manufacturers. How can China use that data? Because that data has not been put out on the deep dark web for sale. So clearly the Chinese are keeping that data with yeah. them to plan, to blackmail, to put pressure on, to per pursue their agenda. And to that extent, David Sanger, his latest book called The Perfect Weapon, Perfect. talks about what Professor Harshpant was saying that cyber threat is the threat you have to gear up for and not traditional threats that we've been wasting so much of our energy for, you know, arguing about. When we talk about Marriott, you see, it's not the question of uh, data of customers being stolen or credit card numbers being stolen. The very reason that it has not come on dark web, it's, it proves the point that it is of strategic importance and it will never come. It will always be utilized at the back end. And if the data is gone, that proves that the network was compromised. And if the network is compromised, essentially what may they have also may have stolen will be the you know video recordings of the public corridors, who's meeting whom, who's staying with whom, how many times a particular person visits. Uh, if you talk about other hacks of Department of US personnel, uh, the, the data which went was also over of the people who were deployed in special forces, undercover agents. Mm. So you see, yes, you look at the you know press release released by the British government and the allies yesterday. They are accusing China of commercial espionage, you know, spread over five to seven years. Um, 
widening across Europe, you know, uh, British interests and even in Asian countries. Mm. And that they are, they are specific in saying that this is well, this was a state-sponsored activity. It was not randomly carried out by some, you know, uh, unknown Chinese hackers. There was Chinese military and state security involved in those hacking. Mm. Now, th that is where the entire question, you know, what I believe is that uh, there were there have been reports of supply chain infection. You see, the personal data of individuals, uh, who is he meeting whom, what sort of likes and fantasies they have, you know, where, where what is the weak points they may have. They, they may be used to compromise individuals to ensure that somewhere down the line, supply chain or the sub, you know product may be infected. And this is what US British government is saying yesterday. They're calling all the managed service providers and you know suppliers across UK to say that ensure that when you're buying the products, double verify them, look at the source, look at the origin, because there was a report that China was able to successfully compromise Amazon data centers by you know, man, uh, uh, you know uh, infecting the supply chain and providing uh, you know, infected chips. So I think that's where the entire threat is originating. It's not about one particular uh, in department being compromised. It's about a larger ecosystem, the dependence being created and using it at the time of war. So uh, the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that we as a country have to ensure that we must do away with this policies of L1 and, you know, transparency. And when it comes to national security, uh, the, the data protection has to take the fundamental, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, progress over all these laws we have. And we have to ensure that, you know, the new five generation networks where we will have all the sensors and everything Chinese companies are not allowed to forget participate not allowed to put directly or indirectly any equipment on the networks to ensure that at the times of war our dual use industries like power grids telecom networks are not compromised and taken down it will have a disastrous effect on you know military operations and the future was as dr. Pan rightly said it will not be it will all definitely will be about you know rolling down the, the fifth generation aircrafts but will also be about disabling radars degrading network-centric warfare capacities, and that's what we must keep in mind and ensure that these companies are not a, a part of Indian networks. And that also requires a certain amount of imagination on the part of our babus, for which is a subject quite alien to them, to be able to sit down again and rewrite the rules on how you get in companies and not be obsessed with that lowest bidder L1 factor. But I want to ask you, Hush, uh, an equally important question, and that is that the U.S. continues to keep saying that there, are, as far as the U.S. is concerned, they've got laws that if U.S. interests are threatened, even through cyber uh, areas, U.S. will regard that as an act of war or matters to that effect. And the U.S. is also very heavily engaged with China in a variety of areas, but they also know that maybe another 20, 25 years down the line, China clearly wants to unsettle it and take away the position as the supremely most powerful country in the world. And there is the Russia factor in American thinking in terms of cyber attacks. So is that what now we are all going to see? And is that going to finally replace the big arms trade business that has been there for so long? And we have the dubious distinction of being the largest arms importer. It seems like that. I think the conversations in the West, in particular in Washington, has been shaken up by Mr. Trump. And to his credit, he has been the first to say that, look, we need to take China very, very seriously, especially the tech element of, of uh, what is happening. And I think then to raise the bar by, by in, you know, imposing tariffs and then to forcing China to negotiate. And if you look at it very carefully, what China is doing is very interesting. It is targeting the weaker parties in the, in the case of Canada. All the retaliation, you know, the, 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 what you mentioned, Huawei's um, CFO's arrest, all the retaliation is against Canada. Whereas the real uh, <laughs> force behind this is America. Mm. With America, they are saying we will cooperate. You know, they are opening up their uh, markets. They are giving them access to agriculture, etc. Mm. So it's very interesting how they how they are playing this game. Mm. They want to have a modus vivendi with the Americans, mm. so that for the time being, they are on the same page. They are engaging with the global superpower, mm. uh, even as they catch up with that global superpower. And I think that's the game. Americans have recognized it. I think it's it's high time India recognizes that too. Right. So very clearly, we are now uh, entering into a stage in, in international relations where a cyber threats and cyber security and cyber challenges are the big ones that we need to prepare for. It is also very obvious that it is perhaps China versus the rest of the world. And in terms of China wanting to catch up, but the rest of the world being equally worried and sounding the alarm against Chinese activities. But how easy will it be for either the West or for India to wean away from the attraction 
of cheap Chinese technology which continues to take roots in all economies, particularly in India, where the obsession is to get the cheapest bidder to be given the contracts, whether for CCTVs or phones or radio networks or rail networks or whatever. But most importantly, while India has created at least the, the, the initial part of a cyber command, but there is still a lot of turf battles that are being fought and have to be fought to sort out how India would actually co-opt cyber security both into our national security and into our financial, economic and energy security, all of which are equally important for India if India has to be secure and sovereign. Uh, thank you very much for being with us on this show and thanks for all your wisdom. Uh, we could have discussed this more, but perhaps on another day. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye and thank you.